Welcome to Life on Life's Terms. This is your host, Chelsea, and today in the studio, we have Jeff Wallace with us. A few topics that we are going to discuss is his life and experience with photography, and we'll talk a little bit about severe weather and, of course, Aurora Borealis. May or may not talk about some climate stuff that's happening. We will see. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. That's a that's a touchy one, hey? I think for everybody. Uh, well, first, Jeff, how about you tell everybody about you? Oh, well, thanks for having me, Chelsea. I'm very happy you're here yeah, today. Yeah, this is going to be good. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess I've been doing the, the photography thing for about, 10 years, maybe 12 years now. Okay. Started when uh, we lived overseas uh, on the Channel Island of Jersey. Um, started taking photographs of the kids, and then you start to look around at the island, and you go, wow, this is kind of a pretty beautiful place. Just can't help yourself. Can't help yourself. I mean, it's just, it's only like nine miles long, five miles tall. Uh, like, France is like 14 miles across the channel, so it's a pretty... Pretty neat place, kind of kind of interesting also because today is is the anniversary of D Day. Yes, I was going to mention that. Yeah, seventy fifth anniversary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Islanders were under German occupation. Yeah. So there's some neat stories that I'd heard when I was uh, overseas. But anyway, it's a it's a lovely little island, and so that's what that's what started that, and then uh, moved to Alberta in two thousand nine. Okay. Yeah. And then you kind of go from a small island of nine by five, and then you got all this. <laughs> amazing space <laughs> and then and then like the mountains are only like three and a half hours away and then so one thing begets another begets another and yeah then, and then the uh the, the interest with the aurora and then the severe weather and mm-hmm. all of those things sort so of one after the other so it yeah. all started in jersey yeah 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 Wow. Yeah. And uh, yeah, speaking of uh, the anniversary of D-Day, I seen the video of all the paratroopers coming down. Mm-hmm. Did you hear about that 97-year-old yes. man yeah. that jumped again? Yeah, yeah. good for him, <laughs> eh? Right? No yeah. helmet. He's like, ah, yeah. here we go. Yeah, he was cheering at the end of it. Woo! <laughs> I've been I've been done this before. Yeah, except this time it was more welcoming of a land for him. Yeah, daytime. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, that was pretty cool. I couldn't yeah. believe that. Um, so last week, Justin and I talked about climate change right. and we had a conversation prior to this because when Justin was in the studio, you, Justin and I, uh, we were discussing a little bit how it's kind of like a taboo topic. You don't really want to go there, right? Like, I mean, in general, I know I don't right. I feel like so much research needs to be done and you don't want to risk having that label as a denialist, but you don't want to say, oh, for sure this is happening too, because then somebody will fight you against that, right? Yeah, like, that's how yeah. I feel. It's yeah. such a tough one. Because um, last week, actually, I talked with Justin about this TED Talks video that I watched, and it was with a climate scientist. And I came to the conclusion that it was a very biased opinion on her behalf because she was very much one-sided. Mm-hmm. She was sure that she was right, and the only way to solve this was the whole world needs to unplug their houses every time they walk out the door and drive electric cars. Right. And that was her, her, well, in a nutshell, that's what she was trying to say. Mm-hmm. But then as I looked into it, because like I said, that this, to me, this topic requires so much research and I, I could be completely naive to it. Right. So I can't make a decision on it. So no. I, I watched this Howard Bloom podcast. Have you heard of Howard Bloom? No. No? No. Yeah, he's got some pretty good stuff. I okay. watched um, a Joe Rogan, Howard Bloom podcast that was recommended to me by Justin, actually, and he talks about envi- environmentalism. And uh, he actually had this one quote that he was saying that the planet has never been climatically stable. So right. So therefore, how can we be blaming humanity? Like, well, there's ice ages, there's global warming, and that's that's where he was coming from. So Right. I, I felt watching that that he had more of an opinion that I could possibly agree with. Mm-hmm. But again, it's not a solid foundation for me, right? Like, I still w- need to look into it some more. Right. <laughs> 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 but, um, you know what? I, I, think, I, think, I think part of the... 
I think part of the problem with the way climate change is communicated is too many people have cried wolf too often. Mm -hmm. And they've made some pretty outrageous claims in the past that have not materialized. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a, there's, I think there's a couple by uh, Al Gore or whatever. Remember that former vice president? Is that, was that, his, was that his name? Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like these, these, you know, these, these folks on the religious fringe that talk about the end of the world and they pick a date and they say, okay, here we go. You know, on, uh, yes. you know, 1989 <laughs> on June 5th, we're all like, it's done. Yeah. And then the day comes and goes and it, it, it it's all over. And I think if people, um, you know, make those kind of claims and then they don't come true, I think for the, for, for a lot of folks, they'll just kind of go, well, whatever. You know, it just kind of, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's more of a, more of a fashion. You know how, you know how concepts and ideas go in and out of fashion? Yes, absolutely. Um, there's, I think there's a bit of that. Mm -hmm. Um, like I've, I've tried to do my own research and, and, and reading on it. And I, I think I'm, I'm convinced that, that mankind has contributed, you know, um, what is it CO2 or whatever, but yes. we can clearly differentiate sort of man-made versus natural, I think by the isotope that it has, you know, they can understand that. Um, but I think, I think for me with, with, uh, with climate change, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a mashup of, of approaches um, that in some cases are too fast in other cases, maybe um, I guess what I'm thinking about is, do we really understand the root cause and are we going to really solve for the right problem of the root yeah, cause? Yeah, you exactly, know? yeah. Um, so that's what, uh, those are sort of the thoughts that I have. I mean, so on Jersey, for example, most of the power comes from France. Okay. And most of it is nuclear. Oh, okay, okay. So from an atmospheric point of view, it's pretty, I don't think you get much cleaner in, in that sense, but obviously it has some 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 problems if if things go wrong with with the reactor well yeah no doubt you know with chernobyl as as well as um was it fukushima remember the earthquake and the the like bad bad things can happen if 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 that goes wrong absolutely it's much more acute and and instant feedback that that stuff just went really really wrong mm -hmm. right yeah but on uh on Jersey, most of the power was was provided by France, delivered by Intersea Cable, and it's and, and it's nuclear, mm -hmm. um, which I think in in a lot of jurisdictions would just be a dream, if you know what I mean, because then you're not contributing directly into the atmosphere. Yeah, right. But I remember like the politicians there were saying, "Oh, we must do more" and all that kind of stuff. But relative to other jurisdictions, I was thinking, "Man, you guys are like way ahead," if 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 you know what I mean. In comparison, so, yeah. So I don't know how much of it is a is it is an industry unto itself. Because mm. um, it was like we were talking earlier about plastic bags, and I think plastic bags, I think, were born out of the the movement to save the trees. Yeah. And we transitioned yeah. from, from let's say, paper bags to all oh, these kind of neat... Yeah, oh, neat, how convenient. They have handles. Well, they have handles. Yeah. I mean, oh, <laughs> this, is, this is kind of an upgrade. Right, right. And, and, then, and then 20, 30 years later, it's like... We need to get rid oh, of those bags. damn. <laughs> While the forests are burning, it's just like, wow. Oh, yeah. It's so hard you know? to wrap your head around it, right? Yeah. And there's just, like, I was seeing so many opinions <clears throat> out there, and almost you don't want to say too much, but you don't yeah. want to act like you don't care at the same time. I just, I just wish maybe if we slowed down. Um, I mean, I know some people think we're not, we're, <laughs> we're going too slow. But I think what I'm saying is, is slow down to the point where you are, doing the right thing and you have the right cure for the right problem. In other words, yeah. if it takes us decades to get here, maybe it'll take a couple of decades to get out properly, considering all the other forces that are acting on, yeah. on, the, uh, on the problem as well. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. Yeah, I agree. And like, there's the, what I like to call is bias conclusions and bias opinions and then there's a lot of misinformation and I mean Too much even of that. even when you when you look at the weather like I think it was back when there was Hurricane Harvey all over social media somebody let out a weather report that mm -hmm. was completely wrong about 
Hurricane Harvey. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was watching, um, I think it was another TED Talks. I like those, <laughs> apparently. Yeah, yeah. I think it was about that and how after that was let out, they actually had to send reporters onto social media to tell everybody this is fake news. This is not actually what's happening with the hurricane or Hurricane Irma. Like, right. here's the actual news. Like, So then you have people out there doing stuff like that. And it makes it even more difficult. And um, it's it's almost like fake news. It's not only just the fake news. It's also the the media itself is it, it adds velocity to it. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not just ringing the bell. It's like ring the bell and it's gone and at over. the speed yeah, of sound. Right? Like it is out there mm-hmm. and it's you can't get it back. Oh, no. no. You know, and no control uh, over, over it so once it, it's, it's released. It's the velocity as well and the damage that it can do. And then once the impression is made, that's it. Mm-hmm. It's kind of hard to un- unwind it's, it. It's so much easier to get it out there than take it back if right. even possible. Yeah. Yeah. So then you, you sort of wonder, wonder, well, is that deliberate or is that just folks trying to get something out as soon as yeah, possible? Yeah, what is their motive, right? Yeah. yeah. But also the speed question. In other words, if you slowed down a bit and maybe did a bit more fact checking or understand the context of what you were seeing, you would give mm. maybe a better update or a better report. Yeah. Or if you're just, you know, not, then almost too eager to have to be heard. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I agree yeah. with that. Yeah. For sure. And um I mean I can say that I don't think we can completely disregard that humans have contributed in some way. Nope. Like, I I mean, look at the smog in China. <laughs> right. <laughs> there is, like, that is obviously not clean air, like you were talking over um, in France and Jersey right. there, right? Uh, I mean, people there are, have to wear, shut down schools or wear masks just to go to work. Or mm-hmm. uh, It's just, it is crazy. Right. And, and then when you think of that also... Maybe if that was a global thing, if the entire planet was covered in smog, I would think, okay, we're destroying Earth. But that's not the case, right? That's not reality. Well, we can look at, I mean, how how um, was it? How Los Angeles had dealt with it, right? How was that? Well, they used to have like smog and smoke all the time from the Just emissions from, from their vehicles, yeah, right? All the traffic. And I think it was also because of the mountains and the way the winds worked and stuff. So they have what different types of. Um, um, was it fuels or something like that that helps knock that down? Okay. Like it's not Smart. just. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's like, I guess it's like understanding the problem and, mm-hmm. and solving it. Or we used to have smog. Sometimes it would appear over Toronto. Yeah. But then um, I think they, call, they closed some plants or something in the Ohio Valley or things like that. Like there were other contributors mm-hmm. to that, right? Absolutely. So, but not, yeah. So. Mm. Well, speaking of poor air quality, mm. let's just switch it up a bit here. Right. <laughs> we are done with that climate stuff. <laughs> right, right, okay. How about the wildfires that are going on? Right. To me, I feel like, is this becoming the norm? Like, I don't, I I know <clears throat> personally my issue with this is I'm a new mom, so I have a one-year-old. Right. And um, last summer, she was only two months old, and I was terrified to take her outside because of all the smoke. Right, right. And then now here we are again, like already we're having just crazy smoke. Mm-hmm. And I think about the long-term effects, right. all the health effects, what is what is going to be going on. Like, is she going to have asthma within a couple of years? Mm. Or you look at people who already struggle with asthma and COPD. Right. I can only imagine what they're going through. Mm-hmm. And um, I think it was, well, that Thursday, just a week ago. Yep. Two, yeah, it was yeah. Thursday when. It was 72 on the scale of 1 to 10 was our air quality. Right. That is crazy. I yeah. actually seen, I think you posted some photos. Yeah. Of a sunrise or a sunset. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that no, was a I was. Shot. <laughs> I was out shooting the, the night before and you could get, sort of tell that something was coming over the horizon because there was a bit of color. And then, uh, yeah, it was Thursday when it all just kind of, was it Thursday or Wednesday? I am not too sure. Uh, I think Thursday. I think Thursday, yeah, because I think Calgary got it Friday. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, Thursday, it was it was that sort of that thick, um, that well, just the haze. I mean, even from a photographer's point of view, I mean, from one hand, it's kind of interesting. On the other hand, it, it, it completely desaturates the color of anything. It's just mm. sort of this, this, this gray. 
And um, like sometimes when there's enough sort of smoke and particulate matter in the atmosphere, it can result in really nice sunsets or sunrises. Right. You kind of, with your eye, you, you, you see the sun, the the intensity, the, the brightness, its luminosity is just knocked right down. And from a certain point of view, it looks interesting. Like it's 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 gorgeous. Yeah. But what always strikes me is that when you do take a picture of it and you're shooting through all that atmosphere, the camera somehow registers the soot. Oh, okay. It's actually very ugly. The Somehow the camera captures the ugliness mm-hmm. of this particular sunset. And it, and you're sitting there looking at the monitor and you're, you're editing and you're... You're trying to Get replicate. Rid of the ugly. <laughs> well, no, it's it's like well, this is the way I remember it, but this is the way it really looks. Like the, it's, I guess on the one hand, it's like well, the camera's not lying. Yeah. You know, and it's not the first time I've had that sort of experience where, to the eye, it's like oh, that's kind of cool, and it's very different because you normally don't can't look at the sun when it's, you know, um, uh, that. Um, um, uh, you know, when it's looking through, through, or we are looking through so much smoke that, yeah. it, that it makes it just look like that, that sort of deep, um, deep orangish red of, you know, like, you know, like as, as iron is, mm. is hot, yes, you know, yes, as opposed yes. to just being bright white light, it's, it's very, um, uh, very diminished, different. right? Yeah. So, so if that's what you're looking at, then that's also what's going in your, in your lungs, in your lungs, yeah. right? So. I think I think Alberta does a pretty good job in in explaining to people, you know, this is what this means. If it's a, you know, if it's anywhere between, I think it's like a four and a seven, it's moderate risk, and then anything north, you know, seven to ten high. plus. Right. Like listen to their, listen to their, um, you know, their advice, and and if you are susceptible or whatever, you know, you you, you stay indoors, mm-hmm. so you don't get those really fine particles into your into your lungs especially if you exercise because then you're exerting more and you're drawing deeper breaths actually i I live right next to two schools one of them is a high school and their gym class was outside running laps in the field i could not believe it yeah i was like i would be an angry parent if that was my child i think i think sometimes that happens when you think oh we'll just kind of power through it but no this isn't one of those things to power through no. this is one of those things where you protect you know the soft tissue which is your your lungs mm-hmm. right you absolutely know, you only got one pair so. yeah yeah <laughs> no doubt well yeah. i've seen online um uh statistics or uh, about the national wildland fires and that day oh no let me see here my date here may 31st yeah there was 110 uncontrolled fires Mm -hmm. and 66 controlled right now i don't know because i haven't looked back any prior dates but is that a normal thing do you think or is that out of control like oh i i mean i i don't know i mean to me it's just a lot earlier yeah it does seem to be earlier in um you know just just by going how edmonton was affected i think i think the last time we saw sort of those those uh those colors and those oranges uh, that we got on Thursday midday um, last occurred in August. But mm-hmm. I think in the past we used to start to see these the effect of the the wildfires, you know, like BC smoke coming into Alberta yeah. and whatever, kind of like in July. Yeah. And then there'd be like, and then I think last year it was most of July and August. There was always something going on. And then this year, it's interesting because I thought I thought this year. We had more moisture, you know, on the ground, like there was more snow yeah, and all that kind yeah, of stuff. I thought so right. Too. But nope, nope. We're we're like third week in May and here we go. Yeah. You know? Already. Yeah. So I don't know. I think I think we'll just have to wait for the the um the the trends to truly appear and just see how it uh it works itself out. Have you um ever photographed any fires? No, not, well, not, not like really active, active ones. I've, I've come across, uh, like wildfires. I think it was Rabbit Creek. Um, I don't, I'm not sure. This was, this was near Abraham Lake. Okay. And it was sort of. Abraham's beautiful. Yeah. So this was just sort of on the, on the South side, just outside the, the Kootenai Plains. 
So I think it was a couple of years ago when, when, a, when a fire went through. Um, I was driving through on my way to BC and there was still, you know, smoke in the mountains and there were smaller active fires. Right. But the, but the main one had already worked itself out and, and, and burned itself out. But I haven't photographed. What is interesting, though, is, is on that particular fire, I think it was on the way back or maybe on the way there. Um, but I wanted to photograph the immediate aftermath of the effects of the fire. Mm-hmm. In other words, it's almost like pristine destruction. Okay, yeah. And it was interesting because um, in some cases, uh, the grass, grasses around certain brush or bushes were still green, but the bush itself was gone. In oh, other interesting. Words, yeah, it was really, really peculiar you know, burn patterns. Yeah. Um, the ground was still warm. Uh, so I remember that impression, uh, as I was, as I was shooting, but it was more of just, I wanted to document the immediate aftermath. And then maybe a few years later, I could go back and, and redo those, yeah. those, those images. Right. Yeah. Um, and have you done that yet? <clears throat> no, I haven't. I haven't. No, I haven't done that yet. Yeah. No, cool. no. Well, I look forward to it. Yeah. That'd be yeah. really interesting to see. Yeah. Yeah. But no, it was more about being in the immediate aftermath and just to just sort of experience and take in the the, the landscape and mm-hmm. sort of the burn patterns and and then I think what caught me off guard is that as you sort of put your you know your 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 your, your walking on the land, how it was still it still had a little bit of warmth. To yeah, it. yeah. So that was kind of I in, can only imagine interesting. Well, the way that you were, uh, I just want to go back a little bit. The way you're talking about the way the smoke affected the lens or the way the lens caught the smoke. Yeah. um, Yeah. That just brought a question to mind. How did you learn all of this about photography? Did you go to school for photography? Like when it comes to knowing how all the equipment works, because I'm telling you, like I can use a camera on my phone, right? right? Yeah, like yeah. <laughs> how did you, I know you got started in Jersey, but right. how did you, because it I've was, seen your was, photos and they're, they're great. And you oh, use words you. describing some of them. I don't have a clue what you're talking about. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll need to work <laughs> so on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but then I can see all the other people who are familiar with photography oh, right. are taking part in this conversation, and I'm like, well, I know the photo is amazing, but I don't, right. I don't understand what's going. on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think. Well, I, I just started uh, mostly self-taught. Oh but, wow! But then also looking at what other photographers are doing with things that I'm interested in. So I only really photograph things that I'm interested in Mm -hmm. I don't I don't do portraits I don't do weddings I don't I don't shoot people I shoot landscapes and things that are of interest to me whether it's the night sky or you know what's happening I like to document milestones so most of it is is self-taught and then being out in the field and then doing the photography getting home figuring out how to develop the images in in post Mm -hmm. and it's just sort of this little bit of a meandering journey then, then you sort of step up and you you start to let's say go on workshops with photographers that are teaching their craft, right? And then that then starts to uh, improve your skills and and all of those things. But for me, it was a lot of time just assembling the different skill sets, and then eventually you start to put them together to start taking hopefully better better images um, of what you're of what you're interested in. Wow. Yeah. Very oh. slow learner. <laughs> I find others are like really quick and I'm like, oh, I'm just going to. And and then and then you find um, things that matter maybe a few years ago don't matter now. Okay. And then you find yourself questioning your work in the sense of, well, why does it even matter? Like, so mm. what? Everybody else has photographed this. Well, so what? So uh, what is it that, that you bring to the table or what is it what's interesting that 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 in a sense tries to stand out and that. I'm pleased with it, and then and then others um, think it's good yeah. too. And yeah. So me, I'm, I'm kind of content uh, photographing topics and things that that I'm interested in because then I think it shows in the work. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's the interest and the time in the field and mm-hmm. all of those things. And then if you are in the field, sometimes you get lucky um, with either light or you know a particular event that that happens that if you weren't there you wouldn't 
you wouldn't right, get it. Right place, right time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so. Um, how about weather shots, like severe weather? Have yes. you done any storm chasing, anything in that line of work? Yeah. So, um, I mean, it's kind of not hard to notice the weather. I mean, I, I kind of liked weather when I was on Jersey just because of the storms. And, I mean, I like landscape paintings and, and there's a... Do you paint? No, I don't no? paint. Okay. I tend to draw, mm. you know, but but not paint. I'm not I'm not good with color. Oh my god, black and white. That's 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 good enough. <laughs> We're gonna hash mark this thing. <laughs> that works too. Shading, baby. <laughs> um, but um, oh, where was I? Uh, say that in again. In Jersey. Oh yeah, yeah. So with the storms. So yeah. yeah, so you have storms on Jersey and and yeah. then the sky, and you start to get the feel of how, let's say, English landscape painters like Turner we start to see the sky and you go, oh man, now I, I get it. Especially yeah. when you see the weather reflecting off the water and stuff. You come here to to Alberta and, you know, you sort of get your afternoon thunderstorms, right? These pulse right. storms that yeah. pop up and then mature and then empty and then, and then, and then move on. And then sometimes you start getting um, like more severe thunderstorms where you'll get like a, like a shelf cloud will drop out and it, it, it starts to look like, okay, somebody's about to get big footed and it has a very mm. photogenic but very isolated structure and then you start to getting into like mesocyclones where the storm itself will then start the barber pole yeah and you get these updrafts and and i mean they're just spectacular what is that called sorry say that again meso mesocyclones where it actually starts to to rotate oh, okay and then the you get these updrafts and they start to go up and they actually physically sort of looks like resembles a, a barber pole mm. um but anyway, they're they're, they're photographically uh, fascinating. Yeah. So, so yeah, I've been doing that now for about two, two, three years. So. Okay. I've only I've only seen um, two tornadoes. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They were they were smallies. They were. It was just one of them I saw in the distance, and it was the first one I'd ever seen. And I wasn't, and I was driving in that direction. And you're kind of looking at it and you think, okay, does it, you know, is it, is it just a cloud that's hanging down like a scud cloud or is it, oh, okay, it has a bit smooth. So that mm. suggests there's some rotation and then you sort of register, okay, that's what it is. And then you need to find a place to pull over to, to try to capture a shot. But by the time I had pulled over, it had already sort of dissipated. They call it roping out and it was done. So what were you feeling in that moment? Um, were you nervous? Said, no, it was far enough away. Okay. So it was more sort of like wow and wonderment and in that sense that you sort of, you know, saw it, if you know what I mean. Yeah. The second one was uh, I was with some some other chasers down in Saskatchewan last summer. Um, and uh, we we saw one touchdown. It was far more substantive than the one the first one I saw. It was maybe maybe a mile away. Okay. So it, it dropped down. It was very sort of rain wrapped um, in the sense that you could see it, but there was a lot of rain around it. It wasn't okay. like a nice clear one. It wasn't like the lawnmower man one. Um, but you could sort of perceive that as soon as it touched down, there was a bit of an updraft of, right. of debris. And you're looking at it, looking at it. And I was the driver. The The other guys were, were observers, so they were able to to shoot it. I couldn't shoot it. So then I really wanted to shoot it. So I got out of the vehicle. We were parked. And I just had my iPhone. So I was at least trying to take a picture of it with the iPhone. Yeah. And iPhones don't work in the rain. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, oh, this is quite the time. to inter You're trying to make it work and it doesn't work. And then it was gone. And it was, it was oh, quite. Oh, you missed it. I missed it. But at least I saw it. And it was pretty, it was pretty, it was a spectacular day out on, uh, in Saskatchewan. Yeah. Where was so. the first one that you seen? Uh, oh, Hardesty. It was near Hardesty. Hardesty. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, are you a family man, Jeff? Yes. How do, does your family feel about you going <laughs> through storms near t tornadoes for pictures? Oh, do they care? No, no they're, they're, <laughs> they're fine with it. I mean, I, I, um, I took, like, I like severe weather and sometimes I try to take, take the girls with me. Okay. You know, we'll just kind of go out and about and, and last Last July, there was a string of storms that were um, kind of like a necklace of storms that were going across um, in Sturgeon County. 
Right. So it was after sunset. So you could see the storms. And I also like to photograph night lightning or what they call nocturnal lightning. Okay. And so I took my uh, my daughter with me and, and then uh, uh, we, we got in, in position. So the storms were sort of moving in front of us in a way. And I'd set up the uh, the camera to take the images. And my daughter was, was sitting in the passenger seat and she rolled down her window. And then there was enough lightning that she was able also to capture it on her iPhone. Well, she probably loved that. And she just thought that was the coolest thing. Yeah. I mean, just to be out there and then just seeing all this stuff. And it was just, it was quite, it was quite fun. Yeah, you know I bet. I mean. That's yeah. exciting. Do you think she's showing interest in photography? No. No, no. no. <laughs> Not no. following in death. No, 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 no. But, uh, but yeah, no, that was, that was, uh. That was pretty good. My youngest, she doesn't like she doesn't like lightning at all. So yeah. I only I only took her out once and then she's like, no, and it's like we haven't been out we haven't been out since. Maybe it was a bit too soon. <laughs> well, just never again was her mentality. <laughs> yeah. Um yeah, actually the irrational fear of well what I find irrational fear of thunderstorms runs in my family. Oh, <laughs> Uh, my sister, a couple of my cousins, whenever there's a thunderstorm, you just know that they're grown adults at home nervous. It's, it's kind of, kind of funny, but I personally, I'm terrified of tornadoes. Mm. I feel like I watched that movie Twister with Bill Paxton and Helen right. Hunt at yeah. way too early of an age. I don't know, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I still to this day have nightmares about being in a tornado it's it's funny i don't know if they just come up when i'm stressed out and suddenly i'm dreaming about tornadoes it's it's kind of funny i poke fun at myself about it yeah but i I don't i don't think i'd be stopping my truck to take pictures if i was near one i'd probably be turning around and panicking and driving quickly away well i think i think yeah it's not like you're trying to get in front of it you're always (laughs) like there's a way to there's a way to position yourself it's like it's it's not so much chasing the tornado because because what happens is is the the folks in the weather office they can see through their radars and and technology they can see pretty well let's say from a hundred and hundred and fifty feet up. Oh, okay. Um, what a what a severe weather spotter does is they're sort of the ground truth for the last hundred to hundred and fifty feet mm. down. So there's certain signatures that will appear in the radar, like with the winds and the way that the, the rain is falling, that, that can indicate, let's say, the intensity or, or what they call the hook. Right. That is a signature, but you really need spotters on the ground in a safe place to then be those eyes to say, yeah, okay, so we now have a wall cloud, which is sort of the lowering. And then if a tornado forms, the, 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 the severe um, weather spotter can then confirm that. So normally they're in a position that is that is safe relative to where the storm is moving. Um, you, you generally always have someone with you who is, who is uh, navigating. So we're always looking at roads. We're always looking for routes of escape. So you don't get trapped down, let's say, some of these range roads or township roads that, let's mm. say, end at the North Saskatchewan, right? right you don't right. want to get pinched or, or blocked off. So you're always, it's really about observing and being in position so that, um, you can then inform, you know, weather can not weather Canada, but you know, environment Canada, whatever they call themselves now. Um, you know, the AB storm hashtag that they monitor, mm-hmm. and then you give your location, the direction, and and what you're seeing, and hopefully with an image as well. Right. And then they can use that as part of the, you know, the, the ground truth, if you, if you, if you know what I mean. Whereas I think in a lot of cases now in the U.S., you have so many people chasing that it's 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 becoming you know traffic is starting to become a problem i mean you, you don't need like 300 people sort of chasing you yeah. know in air quotes in, yeah. in, in in the same thing right right so so it's interesting how how that's evolving in the in in, in the community whereas here in alberta there's there's a lot of space and you just don't have that um you just don't have the people to, yeah, to well, there's not the frequency of tornadoes here either, no. right? Yeah. Like, I um, for this month, I started following people on my social media who are storm chasers. And right. uh, just just recently, when there was a whole bunch down in the States, I yep. believe, happening, yeah, my, like, Twitter account and my social media accounts were just blowing up with all these photographs and recordings from all these different chasers just right. 
and I was blown away. I didn't know there was this huge, this huge of a community that yeah. did this. Yeah. I was just fascinated and at the same time thinking I would never do that. <laughs> right, right. Why would you? <laughs> but if you know how to do it safely, yes. then, you know, it's, it's not as, it's not as, um, let's say random or chaotic as, as, as it appears. Yes, I guess there's a lot to it that somebody like me wouldn't have a clue about, right? Other than what I see in movies. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, So I think from there, let's go from something a little less devastating as like a tornado. (laughs) And talk to us, our listeners and I, about Aurora. Mm. So... Let me get this right, because I only did a little bit of research on this. So okay. this is going to be you teaching me and okay. any listeners who may not know. But there's Aurora Borealis. Yeah. Is that the same as the Northern Lights? Yes. Because there's two. Is there not? A, there's another one that's south? Yeah, the Aurora Australis. Oh, okay, yeah. Right, that's so it. that's yeah. just Southern Hemisphere and then Northern Hemisphere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I had this, I looked up a definition for it, and it is <laughs> very scientific. Oh, okay. It says... It is an electrostatic phenomenon characterized by a bright glow and caused by the collision of charged particles yep. in the magnetosphere yep. with atoms in the atmosphere. Um, for me, I'm just like also known as the Northern Lights. Yeah, is yeah. That, is like, that correct? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. beautiful. It's colorful. Um, from what I've seen in pictures, it seems to be prominently like a greenish color. Is that correct? Yes. So, so what happens is the the um, like some people will say, when's the best time to see the aurora? Yeah, and it's really it's it's the it's the sun's doing. It's whatever the sun is doing oh, depends is whether you'll see it. Um, it it's just you're it's one hundred percent the sun. I so, did not know that. Okay. Yeah. So, um, but the green you were talking about that is where the the energized particle is interacting with oxygen, mm-hmm. and so when it when it gets excited, the oxygen then emits green light. Oh, okay. Right. Um, and then there's other colors that, that sometimes people can see, but then the camera can clearly see because our vision is restricted to, to night vision. So certain colors are less, um, uh, are harder to, to perceive. Okay. Whereas a camera doesn't have the limitation of night vision, so it just sees what it sees. So for, for me personally, I can see, I can see the greens. Um, when the aurora is very active and there's a lot of um, energized particles sort of raining down, it's like auroral precipitation. Okay. Um, the bottom of the curtain will glow pink. Oh, wow. So okay. I can perceive that. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got friends who can perceive purples better than I can. Okay. <clears throat> so purple is nitrogen being energized. Um, and then higher up in the atmosphere, there's, there's, there's ozone. Mm-hmm. Or what they call, I think it's called atomic oxygen or O3. Okay. And when that is excited, it glows red. Okay. And so, is that very difficult for us to see? Uh, the reds are hard. Yeah. Are harder. They're, they're harder. Yeah. They're harder to see. Mm-hmm. But the camera will pick it up immediately, instantly. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and then sometimes if it's if it if there's a lot of activity and I've only the camera's only registered at once, is sometimes you get blue. And so blue is an indication of either I think it's uh, helium or hydrogen. I think when I, I think I, I think I sent a photograph to a, a proper Aurora scientist, and she explained that they thought that the blue was was helium or hydrogen, just off memory, if you know what I mean. Okay, so yeah, so yeah. depending on the on the gas um, that the aurora inter, or the 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 uh, uh, the particles interact with, um, that that will dictate the the uh, at least the colors so that explains yeah. the colors yeah um the auroras they form at the sort of at the edge of space so the very bottom of the aurora is about 50 miles up and they can reach up to 150 to 200 miles oh wow in in the atmosphere wow or you know up there if yeah you know i know what you mean, mean. yeah, yeah. yeah I'm like, <laughs> not breathable but Just <laughs> but yeah no it, it, they're enormous structures so yeah it's pretty it's pretty cool sometimes they're very diffuse Diffuse means that it's just kind of like a green blob and it, it's just, meh, it, it's not really doing anything. It's kind of excited, but half asleep. 
And then other times when it's really energized, you have a lot of particles um, and, and the solar winds are really quite fast. Um, that's when they start to appear active. So this is where you start to get curtains. Um, and then the curtains can often, they appear to move. Right. I was going to ask, do they dance around? Yeah. 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 So, and sometimes, I mean, it's only been a couple of times where they were so active and they were moving so quickly, like almost like uh, unfurling very quickly that it almost felt like you could reach out and touch them. They were that sort of vibrant and that immediate, even though they're so far so away. So far, right? yeah. Yeah. There's only been a couple of times that that's, that's happened at our latitude sort of here in, in, in Edmonton. Right. Um, to see the aurora... Um, let's say on a more frequent basis, you'd have to go up north, mm-hmm. you know, to, uh, yeah. to, to the White Horse or, or, or Yellowknife because right. that's where they um, it's sort of a track that it, that it moves through. Called, we call it the Aurora Oval. Okay. So it's a sort of continuous oval over the, the north and the south pole. And uh, um, that track um, is pretty consistent further north yeah but you need more of a storm to to allow that to come south in our uh at our latitude okay yeah i'm really surprised to hear that it's dependent on the sun i did not expect that Mm. yes so there's 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 two things that can cause the lights one is like a like a uh if there's a if they call it a they call it a chronal mass ejection where there's an explosion on the sun usually from a sunspot right there's an instability and it just goes bang okay and it hurls billions of tons of plasma into space and if the sun if if that if that explosion is 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 um oh, what do they call it um Kind of like Earth effective. In other words, if it's gonna, if it's directed at the Earth, then there's a good chance that three days later, this plasma will arrive. It'll interact with our own um, magnetic field, mm-hmm. and it'll either draw it in or it'll repel it. And then that's when you get the really, um, normally like very active and um, multicolored aurora. Um, they can push down to to. You know Edmonton, Calgary, and if it's if it's a good storm, folks in the in the in the lower forty eight will see it as well. Oh wow! Yeah, um, so that's when the sunspot is 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 uh, I guess it's in, unstable, and then it just releases. Um, we're in what's known right now as as a solar minimum. So the sun the sun goes sort of in this eleven year cycle. We okay. call it a, a sol. And so for about half of it, it's quite active. The sun will, will, there'll be more sunspots and more energetic, and there'll be far more, let's say, these chronal mass ejections. But right now we're sort of in solar minimum, so there's hardly any sunspots. The sun, the, the, the disk itself is pretty dull. Okay. And the only time that we get aurora now usually is when what they call a, uh, a coronal hole. And so I've, the way I understand it is, is, sort of the magnetic field bands on the sun, they may sort of open up a bit. And when they do, instead of the solar winds being maybe 300 kilometers a second, you now sort of get this this blast. As, as the sun is always spinning and rotating, you may now get solar winds of like six or 700 kilometers a second. Oh, wow. So, um, and so when you get these fast moving solar winds, then you have a good chance of of uh of getting and seeing the auroras up here as well how often is it visible here in edmonton i think in the past um about twice a month oh, when okay. we were when it was more active and then it's dependent on whether we get cloud or not yeah right yeah um but now we're looking at i don't know once every two three months i like think it's very infrequent now oh. at least at least at our latitude so this this solar minimum we think will probably last, or they think will probably last for the next two, three years, and then you start to come out of it. There'll be more sunspot activity, and then mm. and then you'll have, you know, at least more more consistent aurora. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so what about the Steve phenomena? Oh, Steve! I have come across when uh, I was looking into all of this. Yeah, <laughs> Steve. <laughs> so Steve, so I photographed Steve. Um. It started to become a thing about two, three years ago, and it started to be registered by photographers because now there's a lot more photographers and you're noticing what's happening in the sky. And what was happening is, is 
everybody was calling them a proton arc, right? Yeah, I think I read that. Right, so it's a proton arc, and oh, a proton arc. And then there was a story where uh, a couple of friends got together and they were speaking with a an oral scientist down in Calgary, and they were they were talking about this uh, this this uh, auroral this, this, sorry this, this this proton arc. Arc, yeah. And he's like, oh, show me show me this proton arc. And so they showed him a proton arc, and he goes, that's not a proton arc. Because it was saying that already in the literature, a proton arc is something that's actually subvisual, and is just kind of a blob. Yes. So then they said, "Well, what is it?" And he goes, "Well, I don't know. I've never seen anything like that before." So as a as a joke, instead of propagating the mislabeling of something, mm-hmm. they just thought, "Well, why don't we just call it Steve?" I you know, believe, after the hedgehog. Um, sorry to interrupt. Was yeah. This uh, Chris. Yes, Chris. Yes, La- yeah, Chris Ratzlaff. Ratzlaff. Yeah. 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 So it was like Chris. Uh, Neil Zeller, and then um, I think it's Dr. Donovan. They were sort of together. And I, I think there was also a, uh, an auroral scientist from NASA Goddard, Liz something, not sure. But anyway, um, that was sort of the genesis of this this idea is why don't we just give it sort of a playful name until we understand what it really is. Yeah. And that just then started to kick off. It just stuck. Yeah, well, it was it's it's fun. It's it's kind of like it kind of started to stop the the mislabeling of it. Yeah, and then uh, and then they started to study it more and and with you know photographers on the ground and and other folks that have sort of these spectrometers that are trying to photograph it with this particular tool. To, I think understand the 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 wavelength. So there's guys on the ground they're trying to observe it, and then you have the the scientists themselves that are trying to use instruments um, both now as well as looking back at past data Mm -hmm. to see if they can start to see, well, okay, now that we know what we're looking for and we start to understand its signature, well, then obviously we can look back in prior records and try to start to understand this thing, Mm -hmm. if if you know what I mean. Yeah, it's a process, yeah. It's a process. And... It's fascinating because I think the latest is it's not really auroral in nature at all in the sense that it's not like it's – it's often associated with aurora, right, in the in a leading edge. So it's – so if the aurora is here, it may be a couple hundred kilometers to the south. It's always equatorial. Okay. And it runs almost like parallel to it. It's like this sort of purple – so sort of like a faint purple yeah, light yeah. with with sometimes it's associated with what we call green pickets. Okay. So I've got photos of it. I yeah. was I got I got it last summer. Um but it's always sort of equatorial of the main auroral display. Right. If you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think what I think what they thought was it's actually um rapidly moving gas that's sort of running perpendicular is that right is that parallel maybe Perpen- no parallel i guess to the aurora oval itself so mm-hmm. it's not really auroral in nature but i think they were thinking that because it's gas that's moving so fast it glows yeah, yeah. so it's quite it's quite fascinating and i think the, the the real win here is the combination of sort of enthusiasts on the ground mm-hmm. with you know uh, the proper scientists in the, in the, um, you know, in, in, in universities and working for NASA and all this kind of stuff and, and sort of now understanding a bit better. Um, it's not like it was discovered. I think it's more or less, it's better understood now. Yeah. I mean, there's images going back from at least years before that it's not like it was a discovery, but I think it was like, oh, well, we didn't quite know what that was. And now there's a lot more, um, you know, information and it's being properly studied and understood. Mm-hmm. So, so same question as Aurora, is that visible here in Edmonton? Do you see it often or is it every few months? Kind of same thing. It would, it's often, well, it, yeah, it's, it's always associated with an Aurora. Right, it's always the same. Yeah. Thing. Oh, but okay. it's, it doesn't always appear with the Aurora, meaning you, you may see the Aurora one night, but you may not you see. You won't see Steve. No, no. <laughs> but then I think the, I think the other thing is, I think what was originally intended just to be sort of like a fun moniker, NASA themselves then started to write, I think they call it a backronym, where they, they try to make it fit, because they thought, oh, we'll just keep this thing going, and, and then they sort of made a uh, a proper term out of it. 
Out of so, out of Steve. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so they actually, no they actually it actually now means something, and I don't remember off oh, the top of my yeah. head, but it, it's now permanent. Oh, yeah, I'll have <laughs> to know? look that up. See yeah. if I can find it. Throw it in. Throw it's it bit, in my blog. It's a bit dense. It's like, oh <laughs> man, you guys tried really hard. <laughs> <laughs> Took something that was all fun and games and <laughs> yeah, it all serious. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about your photography and how you got started because you had mentioned that you. You're not a fan of weddings and portraits. And right. Have you ever tried? Like, did you ever give it a shot, taking people's portraits? Or were you just, you knew I've, right off the bat? I've, I've tried, mm-hmm. but it's just not, it's just not my thing. There's I mean, nothing it's, for it's, you. It's, well, it's, it's, it's a different skill, you know, working with people and then posing them. And then the editing is very different than, let's say, with a landscape photographer. Yeah. So I was pretty well sort of set in my ways. And so I don't want to be a generalist. I just want to be very, very good at what I'm interested in, if, mm-hmm. if you know what I mean. Yeah, so, that makes sense. So that's sort of the rationale behind that. So I prefer natural light over over artificial light and things like that. So mm-hmm. I'm just content where I am right now with with my my style of, of, of photography and, and then try to become... Um, very good in those sort of genres. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Makes sense. So, yeah. Um, what is your favorite place, either a place you would like to go to or previously that you have photographed? Oh, where do I want to go? I want to go places where not many have been. Um, so there's a couple of lakes, for example, in the Rockies that I I haven't found any imagery for yet. Oh, cool. So I'd like How to... How did f- you know about this lake? Um, I just saw it by just examining Google Maps. Oh. So you, you just kind of do... <laughs> you, start, <laughs> you start way up here and you kind of look around and, <laughs> and you go, oh, you know, it has a name. And then, you, and then you start to Google it and see if there's any images for this lake. Oh, that's really, that's really cool. Yeah. And it also had interesting shadows in the imagery as well. So... You kind of tell it's sort of nestled in these mountains, and then there's yeah. no imagery. It's just, I would say it's it's more of an interest now of try to show and go places where uh, not many have been. It's kind of like sort of the anti Instagram uh, uh, crowd, if you know what I mean. Yeah. You yeah. know, I think it's I think, and part of that's just the interest of seeing new things, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And of course, yeah. we're not going to name this lake because we don't want anyone to <laughs> get oh, there before you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, I, can, no, don't. I can name it. I know no one's going to go there. <laughs> it looks tough. And I think it's also like Grizz country too. So I don't know how oh, we'll get wow. there. But Sounds um, like an adventure for sure. Yeah. It's in Jasper, Jasper National Park. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let me see if I can find it. But, do you um, do a lot of hiking? Uh, I do. I like to. I like going on. Um, hikes into the mountains and and um, one of the things that I did a few years ago was I went up on Parker Ridge but it was more or less late at night it was in the sense of going up there um, I wanted to shoot sunset and also do some of the, the night sky and I also had an idea in mind with regards to the car trails there's there's a spot that's called the shooting gallery it's 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 the um Kind of like a huge hairpin turn. Okay, yeah. Um, and I just, oh, it'd be kind of neat maybe to do some, try to high up and get some car trails. But it didn't work out. But at the same time, it was just immensely rewarding being up there and uh, sort of having the whole place to yourself. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, so that was kind of kind of special. I was actually reflecting on that uh, earlier last week, I guess. And I was like, wow, that was really, that was really good. So... Awesome. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, you know what I think there? We're going to wrap it up. Um, would you like to tell people where they can find you? Your oh, Twitter, sure. if you have it. Yeah. So Twitter and Instagram, the the handle is Where's Jeff. Okay. So W-H-E-R-E-Z, Jeff. Awesome. The story behind that, it's, a, it's an old Hotmail account. Okay. Uh, when we moved overseas, um, one of my wife's colleagues... I guess her, her email address was Walda, like Wall and then Dana, like Dana Wallace. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, and he came up with the nom- mon- moniker or whatever, like, where's Walda? So yeah, I'm like, oh, yeah. okay, I'll go with where's Jeff. <laughs> and it's stuck. It's kind of. It's awesome. It's kind of fun. Yeah. 
Okay, and how about, do you have a photography page on Facebook you would like to tell people about? Yeah, sure. It's just Jeff Wallace Photography. There you go, simple. There you go. Easy peasy. Like, easy. <laughs> easy. A lot of Edmonton photos, Alberta photos. Great, all yes. All that kind of stuff. Yes. Yeah. I do recommend people checking them out, especially if you appreciate photography. Yeah. Yeah, so. Well, very good. I, thank you so much for coming out. Thank you for having me. I'm glad you came in after your busy day of work. <laughs> yeah, very easy on the way home. Yeah. Okay, so um, you can find the After the Show blog at www.lifeonlifestermspodcast.com. You can check us out on our Facebook page, which is Life on Life's Terms Podcast, or you can check out my Instagram, which is Chelsea underscore Life on Life's Terms. And my Twitter is also easy peasy. It is Chelsea Kapler. So that is it. We will talk to everybody soon. See you.